we left off. Oh, question. Is there a reason why exam one was taken out of the gradebook? Exam one is in the gradebook. It's not. Oh, I checked this morning. I can see it. So let's talk about that after class. That's a technical issue with Canvas. All the scores are there. From my perspective, it is unmuted. What you should not see is your overall grade in the gradebook anymore because we muted lab exam number two. And if any assignment is muted, the overall grade disappears. So m double check to make sure you're reading the correct thing in the gradebook. Um, let's talk about the adrenal gland. Our adrenal gland is a twofer. It's a two in one. We have the adrenal medulla and we also have the adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla, as the name implies, is going to be in the middle of the adrenal gland, whereas the adrenal cortex is around the outer circumference of the gland. So as we look at the medulla, think medulla middle. And it's important that we, when we talk about medullas, we specify of what? We have the medulla of the kidney, we have the adrenal medulla, there are multiple medullas and there are multiple cortexes in the body. So it's, it's not enough just to say the medulla or the cortex, say the medulla of the adrenal gland or adrenal medulla. So be specific and precise with your answers. Now as we look at the adrenal medulla, it's the minority of the adrenal gland. It doesn't make up that much of it. It is one of those glands that functions as an interface between the nervous system and the endocrine system. And I say that because it is activated by neurons directly. It's going to have sympathetic activation. And when we think of sympathetic, we haven't talked about the nervous system in detail yet. So when you see this term sympathetic, I want you to think of fight or flight. So those, those situations where you have high stress, high anxiety, or you're angry, where you're gonna have a fight or you're gonna run away. Um, and the new one, the new F is freeze, fight, flight, or freeze. So when we think of sympathetic, I want you to think of stress response. So when we think of the adrenal medulla, it's activated by neurons that are associated with the stress response. When you are stressed out, your madri adrenal medulla activates. And it releases two key hormones. Um, this is more of the European um, version in terms of spelling and naming. We have epinephrine and norepinephrine. The Americanized version of that is adrenaline and noradrenaline. So when you stab yourself in the thigh with an EpiPen, you're injecting yourself with epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline. Epinephrine and adrenaline are synonyms with each other. And then norepinephrine and noradrenaline are also synonyms with each other. I'll admit I'm more of an adrenaline guy because adrenaline comes from the adrenal gland. It's nice when the names make sense like that. But epinephrine and norepinephrine are becoming more common. Now, as we look at the hormones involved with the, the adrenal medulla, you know, before we talk about them in detail, let's just talk about the sympathetic nervous system a little bit. If you are angry and stressed, or if you're having that fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system is going to get you ready for a lot of physical activity. So when we look at adrenaline and noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine, the response of these hormones on your body are to get you ready for lots of physical activity. So that's kind of the big picture. Let's look at some of the nitty gritty details associated with lots of physical activity. We are going to have um, lots of high energy fuels mobilized in our body. So we're going to have fatty acids released to the bloodstream. So we have catalysis of triglycerides. We take triglycerides and break them apart and dump the fatty acids in the bloodstream. We are also going to dump a lot of glucose into the bloodstream. To get that glucose dumped into the bloodstream, there's a process that we talked about for the unit one exam called glycogen lysis, where we take a glycogen molecule and chop it up into individual glucoses. So we're going to have glycogen lysis occurring in the liver, where we take the 
carbs that we store in the liver, we'll chop them up into glucose molecules and dump that glucose into the bloodstream. We're also going to have gluconeogenesis. And this term, to review from the unit one exam, is making a new, excuse me, genesis is to make. Neo means new. What are we making a new thing of? We're making a new glucose. So making new glucose. And when we think of gluconeogenesis, this is turning a protein into a carbohydrate, or turning a fat into a carbohydrate. You take something that's not a carb and you turn it into a carb. That's gluconeogenesis at a really gross level. Now when we think of epinephrine, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, is going to inhibit insulin. We haven't talked about insulin yet, um, but just to steal my thunder from later on, insulin lowers blood sugar. So if we have epinephrine or adrenaline in our body and it inhibits the secretion of insulin, the less insulin we have in our bodies, the more sugar we're going to have in our bloodstream. And this is going to help us with that aggressive physical activity. Now, some other things associated with lots of physical activity is we're going to have an increase in cardiac rate, cardiac output, respiratory rhythms. We're going to find that we'll take blood and we'll shunt it to the skeletal muscle tissues and redirect it from the digestive system. So we'll prime the body to be as physically active as possible. You've probably heard of like the cliche of like the mother who lifts the pickup truck off of her child. And that's the, the, the stereotype or that urban legend, because I've never actually seen somebody lift up a 2,000 pound pickup truck, um, is that with all of that epinephrine mobilized in their bodies, they are capable of performing more physical activity than they would have been otherwise. So that was the adrenal medulla. So to really emphasize the adrenal medulla, I want you to think adrenal medulla is associated with stress and epinephrine. Let's talk about the adrenal cortex, the other part of the adrenal gland, the other twofer. So as we look at the adrenal cortex, it is going to be around the circumference of the adrenal gland. When you think cortex, think circumference. And as we look at the adrenal cortex in particular, there are three layers to it. We're going to start with the superficial layer, the glomerosula, and then we're going to start moving deep from there. So as we look at the zona glomerulosa, this is the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex. It's going to be called the glomerulosa because if you look at the cells and the histology in this area, there are little round globs of cells or glomerular shapes to the cells, hence the name glomerular osas. And as we look at this part of the adrenal cortex, it's going to release a kind of hormone known as a mineral corticoid. Corticoid means that this hormone comes from the cortex. And what does this hormone do? It regulates some of the minerals in our bodies. In particular, the minerals we're going to focus on are potassium and sodium. Those are the two most affected minerals, or the two most influenced minerals. Our next layer, so the next deepest layer to the adrenal cortex is going to be the zona fasciculata. And if you look at the cells in this region, they are arranged in long bundles. These long bundles or groupings of cells resemble the fascicles within the muscular system. So you think of, if you think of a fascicle of skeletal muscle cells being a grouping of long cells, we have a grouping or of long chains of cells within the fasciculata. And as we look at this part of the adrenal cortex, we're going to have gluco corticoids being released. So corticoid refers to cortex. A glucocorticoid is going to be a hormone that influences glucose levels in the body. Something that's very underplayed is the androgens that are present and released from the adrenal cortex, the zona fasciculata of the cortex. Um, so we're going to pause for a moment and talk about menopause in women. Um, menopause is, you know, a big deal 
And when a woman hits menopause, she, her ovaries stop the monthly cycle, and she's no longer releasing that estrogen, those, that estrogen that, that's associated with the monthly cycle, from the ovaries. A common misconception is that when somebody is post-menopause, they have no more estrogen in their bodies. And that is not correct. As long as they have adrenal glands, their adrenal glands will release low levels of androgens. One of the androgens, or sex hormones, is going to be estrogen. So when we see this term androgen, I want you to think sex hormone. This also means that in addition to having low levels of estrogen being released by the adrenal cortex, there's also low levels, very low levels, of testosterone released from the adrenal cortex as well. And then finally, our third deepest layer is the zona reticularis. When we look at the zona reticularis, the cells look a lot like the reticular fibers of reticular loose connective tissues. So there's going to be a lot of branching associated with the fibers or the cell arrangement in this layer. So the cells within the reticularis are going to form a web-like network or a reticular pattern. And as we look at the zona reticularis, we're going to have more glucocorticoids released from the zona reticularis. So let's look at those mineral corticoids. And just to talk about root words again, a mineral corticoid comes from the adrenal cortex and controls minerals in our bodies. The mineral corticoid that we're going to focus on is aldosterone. And we'll come back to aldosterone when we get to the urinary system. That's a key hormone that helps to regulate fluid balance in the body and blood pressure and urinary output. But it's worth mentioning now. So the mineral corticoid we're going to focus on the most is aldosterone. And when we look at aldosterone, aldosterone causes our body to reabsorb more sodium from the, form, the urine that's being formed. So it's going to cause sodium levels to go up in our bodies. It's also going to cause potassium levels to go down in our bodies. And as we reabsorb more sodium and dump more and more sodium into our bloodstream, we change the osmolarity of our bloodstream and make it so that more water is pulled into our bloodstream via osmosis. So I want to say Monday, I talked about antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone also reduces urinary output and causes blood volumes to go up, but ADH works in an entirely different way. Antidiuretic hormone causes you to reabsorb water directly. Aldosterone will cause you to reabsorb sodium ions, which changes osmolarity, and then you will indirectly reabsorb water with aldosterone. The net result, or the end product is the same. You have less urinary output and higher blood volume and more water in your blood. But it, they work in two different ways. Now, as we look at aldosterone, it's part of a feedback loop that we are not going to talk about yet. We'll talk about this feedback loop, this multiple hormone feedback loop in Bio 314 next semester. It's the renin angiotensin aldosterone, or RAS system. There's usually an S at the end of that abbreviation or acronym. We also have, as we look at our glucocorticoids from the zona fasciculata and the zona reticulara, these glucocorticoids are going to be released in response to ACTH. If you don't have that abbreviation memorized yet, that's okay. That's adrenocorticotropic hormone. And as we look at ACTH, it's going to help us regulate our glucose levels in our bodies, a glucocorticoid. If we look at the root word again, to emphasize this, regulates glucose levels and comes from the cortex of the adrenal medulla. And another glucocorticoid is going to be cortisol and corticosterone. Most of you have probably heard of cortisol. And when we think of cortisol, this is a hormone that's typically one of the stress response hormones. Um, if you have 
cortisol being released into your body, you're going to have um, some short-term gain, long-term loss. At a short-term level, or at, for a, short, a couple hours to a couple days, it's actually kind of good to be stressed out. Stress is not bad, but it's not necessarily good. It's everything in moderation. A little bit of stress can be good for you. Too much stress is bad for you. So when we think of being stressed out and having this cortisol released into our bodies, this could help motivate you, help energize you to make it through a tough situation. Maybe you have a looming deadline that you need to meet. Maybe there's a temporary stressful situation that you need to overcome. In those situations, the cortisol that's associated with our stress response is a good thing. It's going to stimulate catabolism of both fat and protein. So we're going to mobilize lipids, we're going to mobilize proteins and use them as a source of ATP. We're also going to stimulate gluconeogenesis, making new glucose molecules. And by doing this, we're going to dump extra building blocks into the bloodstream. And we'll have extra glucose in the bloodstream and we'll have the, an easier time generating ATP. For short term issues, this is fantastic. So maybe you have an injury. This cortisol helps you to repair your tissues. We also find that cortisol has an anti-inflammatory effect on our bodies. So if you have some chronic pain associated with inflammation, I'm thinking um, inflammation of the articular cartilage, that's a common chronic pain source. A little bit of cortisol can help with that. Um, however, when we look at long-term exposure to cortisol, um, when we think of day, weeks to months, having elevated cortisol levels in the bloodstream is not good for you. Um, if we think of this, having fatty acids being dumped into the bloodstream for weeks and months at a time will result in plaque buildup in the bloodstream. And you have fat deposits that build up in your bloodstream if you're constantly dumping fatty acids into your bloodstream. And if you're constantly going through protein catabolism, you'll find that you have a very hard time repairing significant tissue damage. Um, if you're constantly breaking down proteins, it's hard to ever build them back up. And then finally, if we look at chronic cortisol exposure, these fatty acids that are being mobilized are being mobilized from one part of our body and redirected to another part of our body. The fat um, catabolism associated with cortisol is typically going to be fat catabolism of the appendages, of the arms and legs. And we'll take that fat, break it down, and dump the fatty acids into our bloodstream. And if, we're in a, if we have physical activity associated with that stressful activity, cool, we'll burn the fatty acids, no problem. But in developed countries like America, a lot of people get stressed out over things that don't associate with physical activities. Maybe you have an overbearing AMP instructor who gives you too many tests next to each other. Maybe you have taxes, or maybe you have some deadline that's looming, or maybe there's a housing situation that's a problem for you. These modern sources of stress still give us the fatty acids in our bloodstream but they don't have the corresponding physical activity that helps us remove those fatty acids from our bloodstream. So what we look, find in individuals in developed countries that are being exposed to chronic stress is that they mobilize those fatty acids from their appendages, dump them into the bloodstream, and because they don't use those fatty acids, they have them build up in their blood vessels, and then they have fat preferentially deposited on the trunk. So we find out that there's a lot of abdominal fat. Um, that's um, deposition that's correlated with chronic cortisol exposure. Let's talk about those androgens. Those androgens, or sex steroids, are going to come from the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis. So when we look at the androgens, the androgen that we're going to focus on is dehydro epiandosterone. Nobody says that out loud though. Everyone will just say DHEA. Um, DH, DHEA came to prominence recently when Sylvester Stallone went through his most recent Rambo remake. 
Um, and as a gentleman in his 50s, or his early 60s, he was completely ripped. And for someone in his 60s to get completely ripped, um, he had to take some supplements, and he spent a lot of time talking about how DHEA was the reason why he was able to put on so much muscle mass in such a short period of time. When you look at the metabolic pathways, DHEA is just a few atoms away from becoming a testosterone molecule. So while it may technically be considered doping if you inject yourself with testosterone, at the time, D or in the past, DHEA used to be a loophole where you could dope yourself with DHEA. There were no regulations against that. And then a lot of that DHEA would turn into testosterone and give you the same effects. The other sex steroid is estradiol. Estradiol is one of three kinds of estrogen. So when we think of estrogen, estrogen is kind of a chemical cocktail of three different hormones that all have similar effects. Of those three estrogens, estradiol is the most potent form of those estrogens. So when we look at estradiol, uh, the estradiol that comes from the adrenal glands is pretty insignificant when you compare it to the amount that's being released from the ovaries, but postmenopausal, that is the single source of estrogen in a woman's body and becomes very important. So when we look at these adrenal glands, there's a lot of interdependence between them. Um, but at the same time, not really. They're next to each other. They're going to share a lot of the same blood vessels because they're physically right next to each other. But when we look at activation of the adrenal glands, they're going to be activated completely different ways. One is going to be activated in response to a hormone, ACTH. The other is going to be activated in response to a signal from the sympathetic nervous system. So when we look at the adrenal medulla, our adrenal medulla, or the middle of the adrenal gland, starts to atrophy or shrink just a little bit if we don't have some cortisol exposure. In other words, we need a little bit of stress in our lives to help maintain the adrenal medulla because that little bit of stress gives us low levels of cortisol, which helps to maintain the medulla. When we look at our medullary region, um, or the adrenal cortex, there are going to be some cells that go from the adrenal cortex into, excuse me, from the adrenal medulla into the adrenal cortex. These cells are known as chromaffin cells. And when we think of chromaffin cells, I want you to think of them as the interface, the, the negotiator between these two glands. They allow for the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla to directly interact with each other. So, I've been talking long enough here. Let's have a review question. Of the following hormones, which has more target cells in the body than any other? We have antidiuretic hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone. Uh, we also have growth hormone, and we have oxytocin. And when we think of this, I want you to think direct effects, because every hormone will indirectly affect every other tissue in the body. So we have to think directly effects when we look at this question. Which hormone affects the most tissues in the body directly? <laughs> Down to about 10 seconds, make sure you answer. And time. So let's take a look. The correct answer is growth hormone. So let's talk about each of these hormones um, because review is good. When we think of anti-diuretic hormone, ADH affects the tissues of the kidney. So that's one target tissue primarily with ADH. There is also going to be some smooth muscle targeting of the smooth muscle of the blood vessels. So ADH affects the kidneys primarily and the blood vessels as a secondary effect. Corticotropic releasing hormone, or excuse me, corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH, is going to have a target gland effect. It's going to focus on the pituitary gland. So not many target tissues. 
when we look at growth hormone releasing hormone, it also focuses on the pituitary gland. So it doesn't have a lot of targets. When we think of oxytocin, oxytocin is going to affect the hypothalamus. It's going to affect smooth muscle of the uterus and smooth muscle of the mammary glands. So, you know, that's three. That's more than some of these. But when we look at growth hormone, growth hormone affects the hyaline cartilage, the fibrocartilage, the elastic cartilage. It affects skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, dense and compact or dense and spongy bone tissue. When we look at growth hormone, it affects, and I could really, I could probably get, list off a dozen different tissue types. It affects tons of tissues in your body. It makes you grow bigger as a person. So let's see how our responses went. Eh, pretty respectable. So let's talk about the pancreatic islets, or the pancreas. Our pancreas is another twofer. Um, the adrenal gland is a twofer in that it's two endocrine glands in one. The pancreas is a twofer in that it's an endocrine and an exocrine gland built together. So let's review terminology quick. Exocrine glands make secretions that will eventually leave the body. Endocrine glands make secretions that are dumped into the bloodstream. So our pancreas secretes to two different locations. It will secrete into the digestive system, and those digestive secretions of the pancreas eventually leave the body. And then we also are going to have secretions from the pancreas that go into the bloodstream. And those are the endocrine secretions that we're going to focus on in this presentation. So from an endocrine perspective, there are little clusters of cells in the pancreas known as pancreatic islets. Um, sometimes I've heard them referred to as pancreatic, um, how'd you pronounce it earlier today? Islets? Islets. That's a potato-potato situation. Um, when we look at the histology of a pancreatic islet or islet, they are going to be lightly stained groupings of cells within some dark pink cell tissues or tissues from the histology perspective. And that little sphere of cells is going to have three different cell types in it that we're going to focus on. That pancreatic islet has alpha, beta, and delta cell types within it. And those alpha, beta, and delta cell types each secrete a different hormone. So let's focus on the alpha cells of a pancreatic islet first. Those alpha cells of the pancreatic islet secrete a hormone known as glucagon. What does glucagon do? It makes your glucose be gone, or excuse me, your glycogen be gone. It takes glycogen from the liver and stimulates the hydrolysis of glycogen to turn it into glucose. So when you think of glucagon, it means glycogen be gone. It takes glycogen and causes it to be chopped up into glucose and dumped into the bloodstream. And this is going to happen at the liver. I need to emphasize this happens in the liver. This does not happen in most of the tissue types in our bodies. So as we're looking at our liver, it's going to dump that glucose into the bloodstream to raise blood sugar levels. Pragmatically speaking, if you have more glucagon being dumped into the bloodstream, that hormone will cause your blood sugar to go up. Hopefully most of you ate breakfast before you came to class today. So you should be riding high in some blood sugars right now from your digestive tract. But by about, you know, 10 or by like 11, 11.30, right before lunchtime, right before mealtime, that's when people notice typically that they get a little hangry, you know, when you feel irritated from lack of blood sugars, and your blood sugar levels start to go down. And in response to that decline in blood sugars, your pancreas will release glucagon, which will cause more sugar to be dumped into your bloodstream to help maintain homeostasis of your blood sugars. Glucagon will also stimulate catabolism of fat or adipose tissue, and will also promote amino acid absorption. So when we look at this process, glucagon ultimately wants blood sugar to go up, and it'll raise blood sugar three different ways. It'll raise blood sugar by digesting glycogen. It'll raise blood sugar by digesting fat. 
and it will raise blood sugar by taking amino acids and turning them into glucose, or another form of gluconeogenesis. The next cell of the pancreas attic islet is the beta cell. And when we think beta cells, I want you to associate that with the hormone insulin. And as we look at insulin, insulin is a hormone that's typically going to be associated with lowering blood sugar. So when we think insulin, I want you to think lowers blood sugar. That's the pragmatic effect of an insulin exposure. So when we look at these beta cells, um, immediately after we eat a meal, we have lots of sugar in our bloodstream. And that sugar causes our blood sugar levels to spike, activates the beta cells. The beta cells will release insulin. And then in response to insulin, our skeletal muscle tissue will reabsorb glucose and turn it into glycogen. That glycogen will be stored in the skeletal muscle tissue. And our liver will also absorb glucose and turn that glucose into glycogen and store the sugar in the liver as well. Other tissue types um, that will absorb glucose include really every tissue of the body. I really want to emphasize the brain, though. Of all the fuel sources that are, we have available in our bodies, our brain is glucose dependent. Um, we need a little bit of carbs in our bodies for the brain to function properly. So I know there's, you know, I think it's called the ketogenic diet now is the trendy name. Uh, when my mom was younger, it was called the Atkins diet. This idea of not eating, a lot, eating no carbs isn't necessarily the best for the brain. Um, eating low carbs, sure, fantastic, go for it. But make sure you get just a little bit for your brain to have some glucose. If we don't have enough insulin in our bodies, that's going to be associated with diabetes. How are we doing on time here? We're doing great. Excellent. We have about 12 minutes. So let's talk about the delta cells. As we look at the delta cells of the pancreatic islets, they are going to release a chemical known as somatostatin. And when we think of somatostatin, this hormone is going to inhibit the release of both glucagon and insulin. So pragmatically speaking, Somatostatin makes it difficult for us to regulate blood sugar levels. It slows down that process of the release of insulin and slows down the process of glucagon release. It's also going to slow down digestion as a whole. And if we have less motility or less action in our digestive system, that food that we ate will sit in our digestive system longer and we can absorb more nutrients from the food. Um, there's been some research into having people take a somatostatin tablet so that they can feel full longer, so they can have an increased sensation of satiation. The, the, the mindset behind this was, if we can slow down peristalsis of the digestive tract by having someone take a pill, that food will sit in their stomach longer and they'll feel full longer and they won't feel like eating as much food and hopefully they'll lose some weight. Um, as you can imagine, that magic bullet doesn't necessarily work. The hypothalamus as well. Yep. So yes. So as we think of somatostatin, I want you to primarily focus on inhibiting nutrient digestion. It slows this process down. It's also going to raise glucose concentrations, not through glucagon action, but through the action of some other hormones of the body. It's going to stimulate um, these hormones to release into the body and raise blood sugar levels. Let's move on to the gonads. When we think of our gonads, I want you to think of ovaries and testes. Ovaries are the female gonads, testes are the male gonads. So as we think of these ovaries and testes, 
They're both exocrine and endocrine. They make secretions that leave the body. The ovaries produce an egg or an ovum. The testicles produce sperm, and those will leave the body. And then they also produce endocrine products. They make hormones that are dumped into the bloodstream. As we look at the ovarian hormones, they include estradiol, progesterone, and inhibin. We'll talk about those in detail in the next slides. And then when we think of the hormone associated with the testicles, I want you to think testosterone testicles. There's also going to be a little bit of estrogen produced at the, testosterone, the testicles and a little bit of inhibin as well. So as we look at our ovary, this is one developed, one mature follicle on an ovary. So this part that we're looking at right here on the slide is a mature or graphene follicle from an ovary that's one step away from rupturing. And as we look at this mature follicle on the ovary, there are going to be granulosa cells that make up the outer lining of the follicle. Those granulosa cells secrete the estrogen. And when we look at a woman's monthly cycle, typically one follicle a month, maybe two follicles a month, will grow larger and then burst, release the oocyte, and then shrink again. And as that one follicle a month grows larger, there will be more granulosa cells throughout the month, secreting increasing concentrations of estrogen. So when we look at the ovary in the monthly cycle, as we have a, an increase in granulosa cells, we'll also have an increase in estrogen. And then ovulation occurs, and then there's the decline of both. And that repeats every single month. We're also going to find that after ovulation, that mature follicle that ovulated still has a lot of leftover tissues. And those leftover tissues will be called a corpus luteum. And that corpus luteum will go from secreting just estrogen to secreting estrogen and progesterone. So when we look at the progesterone, that progesterone is going to be secreted during the second half of the monthly cycle. And then finally, as we look at the follicle itself and the corpus luteum, they secrete a hormone known as inhibin. Inhibin inhibits the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone and also inhibits the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and will mildly inhibit the release of luteinizing hormone. Those hormones come from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary glands. So another way to think of inhibin is inhibin will inhibit the release of the hormones that cause you to release your sex hormones. And this is a form of negative feedback. So as we look at the estrogen and progesterone that come from the ovary, they are going to have primary and secondary effects. The primary effects are all going to be associated with reproduction. So as we look at the estrogen and progesterone, they are going to cause the female reproductive system to be developed. Throughout the monthly cycle or menstrual cycle, there's going to be a thickening of the uterus, the lining of the uterus, the endometrium. There's also going to be um, a development of mammary tissue. That increase in estrogen and increase in progesterone causes the breast to enlarge ever so slightly throughout the monthly cycle. And when we look at inhibiting, just to emphasize it again, it inhibits the release of those hormones from the pituitary gland that cause us to release the estradiol and the progesterone. So follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone as well, but primarily follicle stimulating hormone will be inhibited in response to inhibit. As we look at testicles, you can think of the testicles as a sponge or a bunch of little tubes grouped together. And within the testicles, we have the, the cells of the tubes and the cells in between the tubes. The cells of the tubes are known as serotoli or sustentacular cells. I was taught serotoli, so I can pronounce that word easily. Now, when we look at these tubes that are filled with serotoli cells, the tubes themselves are referred to as seminiferous tubules, and we are going to produce sperm within these cells or within these tubes. We're also going to produce testosterone. The cells in between the tubes are the cells that make the testosterone. 
These are referred to as interstitial cells. That's the new school name. The old school name is Leydig cells. So testosterone comes from the Leydig cells or interstitial cells. And as we have more testosterone being secreted into the body, that is going to stimulate the production of sperm. It's also going to stimulate male libido and secondary male sex characteristics, which include increased bone density, increased skeletal muscle mass, and increased body hair and a deepening of the voice. Inhibin is going to come from a very few cells of the testicles known as nurse cells. And just like with females, inhibin in males as well will inhibit the release of follicle stimulating hormone, in addition to some of the other hormones associated with the reproductive cycle. We also have some miscellaneous tissues and hormones. The skin is going to have mild endocrine functions. Our keratinocytes in the skin are going to convert some steroids into sort of cholesterol molecules into cola cholecholesterol, which is an intermediate of vitamin D in the vitamin D pathway. So another way of taking that skin bullet point and internalizing it is that our skin will be involved in making vitamin D. Here is one of the intermediates of vitamin D synthesis. When we look at our liver, our liver is involved with a lot of different hormones. It's involved with a lot of different processes in our bodies. So our liver is going to take that cola glycerol from the skin and turn it into calcidiol. Our liver is also going to release angiotensinogen. And that angiotensinogen turns into angiotensin II. We'll talk about that in more detail in bio 314. Our liver is also going to secrete erythropoietin, which stimulates red bone marrow to make blood cells. Our liver is going to take growth hormone, and in response to growth hormone, release growth factor one, which causes the tissues of our bodies to grow. And our liver will also release a hormone known as hepcididin, which is going to allow for us to absorb more iron from our intestinal tracts. As we look at the kidneys, our kidneys are going to be involved with multiple hormones, just like the liver is. So as we look at our kidney, it's going to cause us to take calcidiol and convert to calcitrol, which we talked about during our skeletal system. That is going to be the most active form of vitamin D, which will allow for us to absorb more calcium from both the urine and the digestive tract. Our kidneys will secrete a chemical known as renin, or a hormone known as renin, which will take angiotensin and convert to angiotensin 1. And then that angiotensin 1 will travel to the lungs and be converted into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is then going to ultimately raise blood pressure. Our kidneys also produce most of our EPO, or erythropoietin. So most of our blood cell development will be stimulated by the erythropoietin produced by the kidneys. The erythropoietin produced by the liver is a minority of the EPO within our bodies. Our heart secretes a, a category of chemicals known as natriopeptide, natriuretic peptides. These natriuretic peptides are going to help to regulate blood volume and blood pressure and blood water content and are involved with the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Ultimately, when we look at the heart and these natriuretic peptides, they're going to lower our blood pressure. And then when we look at the stomach and the digestive tract, there are many, many hormones associated with digestion. We are not going to talk about them until we get to the digestive system. Um, when we think of enteric hormones, I wanted to highlight this root word or that word. This refers to the digestive tract. So enterobacter are bacteria of the digestive tract. The enteric nervous system is the part of the nervous system associated with the digestive tract. Enteric hormones are hormones of the digestive tract. Enteric refers to the digestive tract. And these hormones will coordinate many different aspects of digestion. We also have adipose tissue. 
It's not frequently emphasized, but adipose tissue secretes a hormone known as leptin, which inhibits appetite. And then our bone tissue will release a hormone known as osteocalcin that is going to cause us to have um, decreased weight gain. So what we find with osteocalcin is that we are going to associate that hormone with the type 2 diabetes onset. And we also have the placenta, which is going to be associated with reproduction. And our placenta releases many of the hormones of reproduction to regulate the pregnancy. And then finally with diabetes, there are two kinds of diabetes linked to insulin. There's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an, diabetes is an immune disorder that is associated with the loss of the beta cells within the pancreatic islets. Type 2 diabetes is linked primarily to an unhealthy lifestyle. And that is all for our recording.